Hello and welcome to what will hopefully be the first of many ProFace America technical webinars. This session will run about an hour and we'll be discussing the Blue Open Studio software. We'll begin first with a short presentation touching on the various features of the software. And then we will show a brief demonstration of certain features and functionality inside of the software. And then we will end with a Q&A session. However, if you have any questions during the webinar, please post them in the chat. Preface it with the word question in all caps. We have our tech support staff monitoring the chat and they will either provide an answer or we will address it during the webinar. So we'll first begin by discussing the overall licensing for the software. The current version is version 8.1 service pack 3. Uh, version 8.1 is a major feature release uh, with 8.1. If you currently have 8.0, this will be a paid upgrade to go to 8.1. However, anything with inside this major version, such as patches, hot fixes, and service packs, will be free. So our second number is our service pack, currently at service pack three. These service packs usually contain service pack fixes or bug fixes and minor feature enhancements. And then we have our patches, and these are typically bug fixes only. Occasionally, we will see a hotfix that is released for the software. However, these are usually on a case-by-case -case basis, so not all hotfixes will be posted to the website. Uh, however, most hotfixes, once the next release, be it a version, a service pack, or a patch is released, those hotfixes get rolled in. And then for our licenses themselves, we have four different types. We have a runtime license, both hard key and soft key, and a build time license, again, both hard key and soft key. Now the difference is that the soft key is tied to the software itself. So once you install it, you will go into the registration utility and you will get what's called the site code. And that will actually be what's used to generate your license. Uh, with a hard key, it's the same process, except you have a USB dongle that you use uh, to generate this code. So the dongle can be moved from installation to installation so it's not specific to a single seat. And then we have four different license levels. We have what are called machine control, line management, supervision light, and supervision. However, most of us just go by the tag count. So 1500 tag, 4000 tag, 32 or 64. And then we also have some add-ons that are available. We have two different thin clients, Studio Mobile Access, or SMA, and Secure Viewer, which is a standalone installation that can be used to connect back to the uh, runtime. And then we have Import Wizards for Factory Talk, both ME and SE, Panel Builder, and Panel Mate. And of course, our USB hard key, and then a Business Intelligence Dashboard Template. And this is a pre-canned application that allows you to configure it to show dashboards, OEE, and and-on information. Uh, for more information on that, we have some literature that's available uh, to discuss it. And for the license comparisons, hard key and soft key, the hard key is typically the USB dongle and your license label or sticker, and the soft key is the sticker only. The Benefits for the hard key is that it's easy to reuse or to move. So this would be ideal for developers. Uh, so you can install your development license or build time license on the hard key and simply move it around from install to install. So you have a single development license that you can use on multiple Blue Open Studio installations. However, the downside is that there's an additional cost to buy the dongle and there is risk of breakage or loss with the USB key. Uh, with soft keys, the pros are there is no physical equipment. You don't have to have a dongle, you just license your software. The uh, downside though is whenever you need to reinstall the software or you have to reinstall your operating system, 
the license will need to be reactivated because the site code that's used to generate your license will change on a new installation. And then our four license levels, you can see here, we have the four, but also next to it, you will see what's called simultaneous drivers. And for version 8.0, each license had its own limit or number of simultaneous drivers. Now this isn't devices, this is actual drivers. So for example, uh, Modbus TCP, Ethernet IP, and let's just say a Modbus serial. Those are three individual drivers. However, thankfully with 8.1, we've eliminated the simultaneous drivers. So now, even the lowest count could use the maximum, which is 32 unique or individual drivers. In a quick summary of the licensing, Blue Open Studio has an evaluation period. And this is 40 hours of use, of running time. So if you install the software and you say operate the software for five hours and then close it and you don't come back to it for two weeks, you still have 35 hours left. And the evaluation version is the real version. There are no, fe there are no feature limitations. You have no restrictions. It's 40 hours of running time. That's the only limit. The only other limit on the runtime side though is that the runtime will run for a total of two hours or consecutively and then it will stop or close, but you can restart it once it stops. And once you purchase a license, in order to generate your site key to authorize your installation, you'll need the following information. You'll need a site code, which is found in the registration utility of the software, and then a serial number, an activation key, and a part number, which are all available on the license sticker that you would purchase. And then you go to our submission website and you fill out the form and you then submit your registration and you receive an email with your site key. You would then go back into the registration utility where you found the site code, enter in the correct site key, and then it will authorize your software. And now getting into the software itself, uh, Blue Open Studio is an easy to use or very, very learning curve friendly software for HMI and SCADA applications. It builds upon the IoT Industry 4.0 solutions. Uh, we bundle it with our industrial PCs. However, it can also be used not only for HMI apps, but also your SCADA system for data collection. We can use embedded or mobile devices for thin clients or extended stations. And the development environment is what is called an Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. And this can allow you to deploy and run multiple applications across different platforms. The build time is not tied to a single application. You can open multiple apps in there and download them to different targets. The only current limitation is we can only install on Microsoft operating systems. And inside of the software, it's a comprehensive set of HMI and SCADA tools. It's not like other software packages where you have to buy the core package and then you purchase add-ons. Uh, for example, there might be a reporting feature that you would need to purchase separately. With us, everything's there. Reporting, scheduling, scripting, our drivers, uh, thin clients. The only thing that needs to be purchased for those is the license for the thin client connection. The actual functionality is within the software. And each license comes with one thin client connection so you can at least demonstrate or test it before you make a commitment for how many thin clients you may want to use. But everything is included in there. There are no additional licenses for development. As stated earlier, the only add-ons that you would use in development are the import wizards. And that is a one-time purchase and you get all three import wizards when you purchase that add-on. And the big benefit for the software is its modular architecture, what's called a layer of abstraction. And what this does is this allows us to compartmentalize our application. So we can quickly 
change out a feature or an aspect or a configuration. Uh, the best thing to um, the best way to describe this is by uh, using drivers as an example. So let's say that we have an application set up with uh, a Modbus TCP driver and we want to switch it over to Allen Bradley. Well, in other softwares, what you may have to do is you may have to go in and change your addressing or whatever registers you're using inside of different aspects of the application, then delete the driver and then add a new one. With Blue Open Studio, we don't have to do that uh, because it's tag based. Uh, so all that we need to do is we need to simply configure the new driver and then we can use something like Excel or a text editor like Notepad and then we can copy our tags that are used in the Modbus driver and paste them into the new driver worksheet for Alan Bradley's for example ABC IP and then just configure what IO points those tags associated to and then we just delete the Modbus driver and we're set. We have now migrated over to a different communication driver. And that's what we mean by layer of abstraction. We can switch things out without modifying or manipulating or having to change too many aspects of the application. And just to kind of expand a little bit on the layer of abstraction, that is a definition that comes from previous PC-based control software. Think of like Steeplechase or Think and Do. Essentially, you're utilizing the hardware abstraction layer that allows applications such as Blue Open Studio to access the hardware of the host system. So this is done through an API. So that's how we can accomplish this compartmentalization or layer of abstraction we simply use connections to go from one component or one feature to another. And another benefit of the software is 100% compatibility with applications designed in previous versions. And what this means is that if you have an older application designed, say, all the way back in even Studio 1.0, which was released in 1997, that supported Windows NT or 95 or Windows CE, we can migrate that in to the latest version of Blue Open Studio, which supports all the modern day operating systems along with some Windows Server OSs as well. And this will allow you to bring the application in and run it almost as if it was running on the original system. So this helps in protect your investment through migrations. This type of compatibility is expected to remain indefinitely within the software. And in fact, some features, for example, some screen objects are, remain inside of the software strictly for legacy purposes to help keep this compatibility enabled. The software is also what's called platform agnostic, meaning that we can deploy across multiple operating systems when it comes to the runtime. So say you have your spectrum of installations, your spectrum here is for the purpose or what application you want to use. Uh, in the middle we have our standard HMIs. This could be one of our oper operational terminals or even a third party PC. Or it could also be uh, a small client sitting uh, on say a washdown line. We can create the application that runs here. This would be the primary application, this would be what would be used to collect information, control the machines, you know, process whatever data you need, and then we can distribute it wherever we need to. And then on the left side we have our SCADA system. So this could be a server installation that is collecting information from multiple HMI stations. We bring it in as a data concentrator and then we can say publish it to dashboards or we need to use it for say OEE purposes or maybe we need to send it off to a larger collection house instead of just the simple server station that we have. 
And then also we can publish the application to be used on our mobile or embedded versions of the runtime, uh, our thin clients essentially. And this would allow us to then, say, be able to monitor the application wherever we are in the facility or even remotely. And of course, all the modern flavors of the Windows operating systems are available for the HMIs and SCADA side and even embedded. And then for mobile, with our thin clients, we're able to use not only Windows, but also Android and iOS OSs as well. And speaking of deployment, the software allows you to deploy to multiple stations, even with the, sim the same application or different apps. So for example, let's say we have our different types, headless devices, so just node PCs sitting somewhere in our plant. We also have local HMIs, which are our operator terminals. And then we have our dedicated use stations, which would be using the secure viewer thin client. This would simply be a, say, remote terminal somewhere off-site or even, you know, outside uh, at the front door. And then studio mobile access, which would be our mobile or smart devices that, say, the plant managers would use to monitor the entire plant on a, any given day. Our single development station here can be used to deploy to all of these stations, all of these installations. And the term we use for that is develop once, deploy anywhere. This is used with a single integrated development environment, so our build time, our development side, will be able to program a single application that can serve all of these or several applications that then we can just simply open up transfer, download, whatever term you'd like to use to these different stations. And then we're doing it all from one single development location. And with the software, there are several different components for connectivity. And when we discuss connectivity, we're not just talking about communication through drivers. There are several different methods that we have. We have web solutions using HTML and XML. We can generate XML or HTML reports or even XML recipes that can be accessed from any system using a single browser that supports HTML5. Not only that, but these can also be served up through uh, IIS as a website that can be viewed through a web browser on a PC. And we have TCP IP, OPC servers, and clients that are able to be used on our remote stations. This can be used for not only data redundancy, but third-party systems, and as I mentioned, our secure viewer thin clients. And then XML, ODBC, ADO, DDE, pick a database acronym. Chances are we're going to be able to use it as a communication device. And this can go to one of many different database systems. Excel and Access along with databases can be used. We have the big ones, Oracle, MySQL, Sybase, and SQL Server, but also the online or cloud services like Azure, Wonderware Historian, and many others, including Amazon's web services. And then we have a driver and database API. These are add-ons that can be used to create custom connections or custom communication drivers essentially to go to specialized devices. So for example, let's say that you've built your own database server or you have a specialized device that you had to write the protocol for. The driver or database APIs is what you would use in order to create the communication protocol inside of Blue Open Studio to communicate to those devices. And as I mentioned, we have several drivers, over 250 protocol drivers available inside of the software. We can go to just about any major device, Omron, Allen Bradley, Siemens, uh, Beckoff. Pick a name, chances are we're going to have one if not multiple drivers that are available for that brand. And of course we have Modbus, we have Ethernet, Serial, uh, DeviceNet, sp specialized protocols for that specific manufacturer. The only thing that would need to be added is perhaps a communication card that is provided by that device's manufacturer. And if 
we don't have a driver available, there is also the generic Ethernet and a generic serial driver that you can use to create your own communication handshake and data transfer back and forth. And this is typically used for things like scales or barcode readers, something that maybe doesn't have a driver, be it a USB driver or a protocol driver that you could use to communicate. So a serial USB, or I'm sorry, a serial barcode scanner would use our generic serial driver in order to establish communication and retrieve the information from the scanner. And then finally, our mobile access, or studio mobile access, or SMA. Uh, this is not only our thin client, but also we're able to use protocols, um, I'm sorry, standards like OPC to send data to not only the OPC server, but also uh, other clients or other servers that use the OPC protocol. We know that some devices or some PLCs use OPC for their primary communication hub or protocol, we can use that to communicate to them if there's not a dedicated driver for them. Additionally, with these, we also have the capability for sending email or transferring data through FTP uh, functions as well. So we're not just limited to transferring data or information via our OPC or device drivers. And any single application can use one or all of these methods to communicate to whatever devices, stations, servers, whatever you may need to uh, transfer or send and receive data to and from. And speaking of communication options, inside of the software, we have the four big ones. We have the drivers, as I stated before, over 250 native drivers. These devices can include anything from PLCs, temperature controllers, motion controllers, and so on. And then we have TCP IP. Now this isn't just talking about ethernet or internet communication. This is an actual protocol that we have. They're called the TCP IP worksheets, and they allow us to communicate, send, sending data back and forth between one or more Blue Open Studio applications. What you do is you set up a TCP IP worksheet on the client and then you have a server and what they do is they keep the data for the tags listed in that worksheet synchronized between the two stations and it's not just a simple point-to-point -point. you can have multiple applications set up so you can have one application communicating to several or you can have almost like a ring or a round robin type of communication where all of the stations are communicating to one another through the TCP IP worksheets. And this helps to eliminate the need for a driver to simply just relay data between applications. So you can set up a whole network of Blue Open Studio projects talking to one another without needing a single driver configured inside of the entire system. And then we have dynamic, I'm sorry, dynamic data exchange or DDE. And we use a DDE client worksheet to configure connection to the server. And this worksheet or task can be any application that supports DDE. This is typically Windows based apps. And the big four, as you see on the screen, you know, Microsoft Access, Excel, and Word, but also Kepware's Kep Server EX version 5 and 6 can use DDE as well and there are numerous others that still support DDE. And then ODBC, or Open Database Connectivity. And we use, a once again, a task and a worksheet to communicate to the standard Windows ODBC driver. So every version of Windows has an ODBC driver pre-configured or installed. All that we need to do is we need to configure that to be able to communicate to whatever our database server or our destination for the data is. So for example, uh, Excel, we would configure a Microsoft Excel worksheet for the information and we just configure the ODBC driver to connect or find that Excel file and then we configure the worksheet inside of Blue Open Studio to tell the driver where to go. So think of the driver as a directory and we would check that directory for the information we need. We'd ask where or what data is in cell C5, and it would go to the database or the Excel worksheet in this example, get the data, bring it back, and send it to us. 
And as you see on the screen, there are several different applications or programs that still support ODBC. We have the Microsoft Office programs, Kepware, but also SQL Server, MySQL, along with several others. And then finally, OPC. And I won't get into too many details exactly what OPC is, but it stands for Open Platform Communication. This is essentially a standard that was developed for process control. And essentially what it is is a group got together and they came up with these standards and specifications that devices should adhere to in order to be what's called OPC compliant. So essentially what you do is you create your device and you say, hey, we would like to be OPC compliant. You send in your specs and your you know, information about how you communicate to this OPC group, which is the OPC Foundation. They review it. They tell you what you need to fix, what you need to do in order to be compliant. And so it goes back and forth. So essentially, this is a certification that you get for communication. But once you are OPC compliant, then it becomes much easier to communicate to other devices communicating over OPC. So for example, we have our field devices out here. Temperature controller, a stepper motor, a PLC. And then we have our runtime, our Blue Open Studio IPC, or I'm sorry, our industrial PC running Blue Open Studio. And we want to communicate to all these devices. Well, we could set up three separate protocols to go to these three different devices. But if they all communicate over OPC, what we would do is we would have a defined standard, which is the OPC protocol. And we would connect to the server, which would then handle communication or data collection from all of these different devices. So we would really need to communicate just a single language. So think of OPC as a translator. And we only need to speak one language, which is OPC. And we have four different types available. We have OPC DA, which is Data Access or OPC Classic. We have OPC UA, which is, stands for Unified Ar Architecture, which is a newer version. It's not a, necessarily a successor to DA. It's, it's a newer version that's a different brand. This is more internet-based. It's more online-based type of OPC. There's much more security involved with it as well. And then we have OPC.NET and XML or DA. And we have native redundancy for OPC UA and OPC XML and DA interfaces. Nope. And one more thing I want to mention is that we also have an OPC UA server available inside of version 8.1. And then we have our mobility options or our thin clients. And we have two that are available. The first is Secure Viewer. And this is a Windows-based application. It's a small app. It comes with the software. You don't have to purchase anything as far as actually installing the Secure Viewer. And it is based off of ActiveX technology. And this is designed for local networks, so say a plant network. Uh, it can be used across the internet. You would use a VPN or web tunneling in order to get from point A to point B. But this is really a point-to-point -point connection. It's designed for local networks. We configure the secure viewer with the IP address and the path we need to get to, uh, the port, if there are any security credentials. Once that's configured, we run the application and it connects. And this is truly an extension of the runtime. This is, once it runs, it looks like you're right in front of the actual runtime on the application server or application PC. And the second is Studio Mobile Access, or SMA. And this is platform agnostic. What that means is that we can use any operating system, and it's also web browser agnostic. And as long as the web browser supports HTML5, we can use any browser on any operating system in order to connect back to our application using SMA. The one drawback with SMA is that not all the features inside of Blue Open Studio are supported. All the native features are, for example, trending, or a trend control object, or recipes, animations, those are supported. What is not are ActiveX and .NET controls. Now, those are very specialized um, features, and we'll actually touch on them here in a little bit. But those are the only ones that really are not supported through SMA. 
And the only difference, or the real difference between these two is Secure Viewer is its standalone application to connect back to the application server and view the project. Where SMA really is a extension that you're using inside of a web browser. So a web browser is required for SMA to, to work. But other than that, the functionality is the same between the two. And then finally we have, I'm sorry, not finally, but we also have our database interface. So say we connect to our remote station, uh, mobile device, a headless device, or even our HMI. And we can do that through our database connection using any of the large or the big four right here, SQL, Server for Microsoft, MySQL, Sybase, or Oracle. And those are easy to configure to interface any SQL relational database, um, including Microsoft Access and Excel. Uh, interfaces via standard technologies. Um, we have the capability for redundancy or store and forward. And we have alarm, event, and trend histories and process data. So we can configure those features to automatically send information to the database. So we don't have to set up a separate connection for that. It's done right inside of the feature. Okay. And as far as the database patent, essentially what it is is it's for the Studio Database Gateway here. So we have a, a gateway that handles the communication between the application and the database itself. So our requests for information or our commands to write data go out to this gateway, which then writes it to the database or retrieves it from the database and then sends it back to us. And that is how we're able to speed up communication between our application and databases because that gateway will handle those connections. Okay, I'm hearing that there might be some sound problems. Um, let's see. Okay, hopefully that took care of it. All right, so we're, we'll keep going here. Oh, and there's our patent. There's the, um, the actual verbiage for the patent and the patent number. So essentially the patent is for a method and system for communicating between embedded devices and relational databases. And then we have an integration to ERP. Uh, so ERP, Enterprise Resource Product, or ERS, Enterprise Resource System, basically think of it like um, a giant repository of data that connects to a database. It's the front end for that. Um, we aren't looking to replace ERP systems. We're looking to enhance. So let's say that there's a report that your ERP system just won't allow you to get. Um, we'll be able to provide that uh, capability. We'll be able to fill that gap. So we're not looking to replace ERPs with Blue Open Studio. We're looking to enhance their functionality. And then we'll quickly, we'll discuss the graphics here. I'm sorry, we'll discuss the features now. Uh, the first is graphics. Um, we have several different functions available. The first are link symbols. So with these, we can create custom graphics that can be used in numerous locations across the screens. If you make a change to the master symbol, then that change is cascaded down to any symbols or link symbols used on the screens. So let's say you create a, a symbol with your company's logo. Let's say in a few years your logo changes. Well, you can go back to the master symbol, change your logo, and then save it, and it will cascade that change down. So that link symbol could be used on 100 screens. You don't have to make a single change in order for it to um, cascade or reflect on your screens. Then we have active objects, and these are things that you can interact with. So there are text boxes, combo boxes, smart messages, the data grid or grid object, trend control object, things like that. And we have several different active objects available for you to create your HMI screens. 
And then we have animation capabilities, and these are things like rotation or color animation. We can resize or reposition. We can even make things visible or semi-transparent. Uh, and then, of course, we have bar graph animation as well. And these can be used on all of our active objects. Some can only use certain animations, but when you're configuring that in the software, the software pretty much tells you which ones are available for the object. And then we have multi-touch capability. Uh, the software supports multi-touch and on our PS5000 series this works fantastic and we can use modern smart device uh, gestures like swiping or pinch and zoom and then of course multi-touch some multiple points on the screen. And then the main component inside of Blue Open Studio are our tags and there are two major facets to that. It's the tags themselves and it's the tag database. So the tags are what we use to share data between different components of the application or send out data to a device or PLC. Um, instead of using I.O. addresses from the device, we create tags inside of the software. And the only time an, an I.O. address from a PLC or device is used is in the driver worksheet when we tie it to a specific tag. Anywhere else, tags are used inside of the software. And this is the big reason why we're able to accomplish that compartmentalization or layer of abstraction, because we're using tags throughout the entire application. We're not tying to specific device addresses. So if we change, say, the data type of a tag, or we change our driver, or we change, say, a database connection, we're not really losing any information because the information is held inside of the tags. And then the tag database is an object-oriented database. So think of it like a spreadsheet inside of Blue Open Studio that allows us to view our tags but also modify or configure them. And we can configure things not just the data type but also uh, a startup value, a min and max for that uh, if it's retentive. And then we can also configure things or view properties for the tag. So a timestamp in the last time it was changed, its alarm value, its health as far as whether it's good or bad depending on if it's communicating to a device or not. And the tag database is live. So that means that we, could, we can in development change the value of a tag and actually see it reflected on the screen. And also in runtime we can do the same thing. So if you want to test your application you don't even have to connect to a device. You can simulate the data coming in from your communication uh, driver through the tags database using the database spy. And then we have tag integration. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to bring in a list of tags from a third-party application. So for example, Alan Bradley in the RS Logics 5000. We can export the tag file to say an uh, RS, or, you know, an L5K file, and then when we configure tag integration inside of Blue Open Studio, we're not actually bringing the tags in. We're not importing the file. What we're doing is Blue Open Studio is querying the file for the tag list or the data or information for the tags. Then it brings those results back in. And if we use them on a screen or we want to configure them to be used, say, not only on a screen, but say in a report worksheet or uh, scripting, we would create a driver worksheet in the background that would handle all the communication. So all of that is done for us. And essentially this tag list now becomes part of, or the tags that we use off of the list actually become part of our application. So we don't have to worry about configuring a driver or trying to create tags to link to real-world I.O. on that device because we're bringing in the tag list from that device already. And then we'll quickly touch on the features. <clears throat> uh, first we have alarms. Uh, alarms can, all, can be real-time or historical. We can log to a binary file format that is localized to the application or we can log them to databases. We also have the capability for remote notification or status information. Um, trending, 
we have both a trend worksheet and a trend control object so we can simply log information to either a proprietary file or to a database and then we can also display that information on the screen. Both of those don't have to be used in conjunction. We can have a worksheet that's simply logging information or we could simply create a trend control object that's displaying real-time data. Now that data won't be recorded without a worksheet but we can at least um, display the information on the screen. And then we have reports. This allows us to generate reports with tag information in several different formats. We can create them in just CSV, plain text, XML, uh, HTML, and we could also print any of these out as a PDF as well. And we can integrate in with Microsoft programs such as Office or Excel and also uh, Dream Reports. Then we have recipes. We have a task available to configure recipes for saving, loading, initializing, deleting. Uh, so there is no real front end, there's no recipe control object, but we have the background. And all you'd have to do is essentially create a screen to help you manage your recipes. And then our event logger allows us to track information. Uh, this could be anything from a change in a tag's value, if someone logged in or logged out, moved screens, uh, triggered a script, anything like that. And this event logger not only can go to a proprietary file, but also can save to a database as well. And we can integrate that or configure that right in the feature so we don't have to create our own database connection. And between this and security, this allows us to be um, 21 CFR Part 11 compliant for FDA. And anyone who uses or is in the food or drug um, industries know that that compliancy is, is a big deal when it comes to trackability with, with drug manufacturing or with, say, just, you know, food handling. And then we have our multi-language feature. Uh, this allows us to develop the application in one of many different languages. Uh, but we can also use the translation tool to translate our runtime application into one of several lang different languages at runtime. So we can develop it in English, but then let's say that we have a global project that we're working on. We can configure that to be several different languages and just simply hit a button on a screen and swap languages from, say, English to German. And as I mentioned earlier, with security, this supports group and user accounts, e-signatures, uh, traceability, along with the event logger to become that 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. Uh, we can also connect to Microsoft's Active Directory. Uh, and we can allow users to set or modify their passwords through the Active Directory using Blue Open Studio projects. And this security feature is not only at runtime, but it can also be used in development as well to prevent unauthorized access from different components of the software. And then we have email and FTP functionality. It allows us to configure uh, an email server to connect to to send emails. So this could be for say alarms. If an alarm goes off we can send off an email or a text message. We can also using scripting functions send off an email with a custom message. So let's say unit powered on. As soon as the the HMI boots up we can send off an email saying that it was powered up. And then we have the capability with, through FTP to upload or download files to or from the BOS application. And then through application automation, we can use several different features to accomplish just about anything. Uh, we have two powerful scripting languages. We have the built-in, which is just a, a group of functions that are available for use. Uh, and then we have support for VBScript. And the built-in language functions can also be used inside of VBScript as well. 
So you're not limited to one or the other. You can use both. You can just stick to one if you want, or you can use them in any sort of fashion that you can think of to pretty much accomplish just about anything you want. And then we have our scheduler, which think of this is like a long list of triggers. This automates, um, say for example, any sort of function you want, like tag changes, or let's say at 8 p.m. every day you want to run a report. Well, you can set up a log, or I'm sorry, a scheduler event to trigger that report generation. Um, I've seen this used for logging off or logging in a specific user at a specific time to say generate that report or to connect to a specific location to say retrieve data over FTP. And then still under advanced features, I mentioned before ActiveX and .NET controls. We're able to use those third-party controls inside of the software. Uh, Blue Open Studio comes with several pre-canned ActiveX and .NET controls, but also it will be able to reference or look up any that you have registered or installed on your system. Additionally, you can add new ones at a later time, and the software will be able to automatically bring them into the list available. And then we have custom widgets. And these are similar to the ActiveX or .NET controls, but these are custom made. So you actually create them. And they're very powerful. They can do quite a bit, but the one downside is that you have to be relatively knowledgeable in HTML and uh, JavaScript programming. So it's highly recommended that if you're going to use custom widgets that you have someone who has knowledge in those programming languages to help configure them. But the best analogy I can give for custom widgets is think of Blue Open Studio as a toolbox. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty big toolbox. There's a lot of powerful tools you have inside of that. But up until now, you were stuck in the hardware store with what tools you can add into your, your toolbox. With custom widgets now, we kick the doors open, we send you out into the world, and now you can add tools from other locations, other places to be used inside of your toolbox, or in this case, inside of the software. And then the grid object, which is probably the most versatile object in the software. This allows us to display, save, modify data from several different types of sources. It could be text files, it could be class tags, it especially could be databases. So you could create a front end for your database simply by using the grid object, linking it to your database table and telling it what columns you want to display. And then for troubleshooting, we have a lot of debugging tools available, not just for our scripting, but also for overall performance. So we can look at values through our database spy. We can check communication health or communication status through the log win. We can capture when things happen, like screens opening and closing, when someone logs into the system, when a tag changes, uh, or database or OPC uh, status or error messages. And then we can also use debugging tools through scripting to say set a breakpoint, step into, step out of a particular segment of code just to debug uh, just about anything inside of the software there's a tool for it. And we have remote management and this allows us to remotely connect to a target station to transfer the project, transfer specific files, say we don't need to transfer the project but we updated some recipes. We can connect and transfer those files only down to the application or down to the installation of the project. This can also allow us to remotely debug the application using the remote database spy and the remote log win or output window. Uh, so think of the remote management like a transfer tool. Uh, we can not only transfer the project down to it, we can also pull it off of the station as well. Okay, that concludes the presentation. Uh, are there any questions so far about anything that we've covered? I'll wait for a little bit for them to come in. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to bring up the software.
Okay. Let me bring it on down here. So I will quickly restore the default view. So now we are inside of the software and let me bring up, this is it's the wrong app. Actually, it's the wrong version period. I wanted to show you 8.1, my apologies. So now what we'll do is we'll take a look at some of the features inside of the software. And what we're going to look at as far as the project is, is the PC demo. And this project comes with every single installation of the software. So once you install the software, this will be the first project that comes up. Uh, also, if for some reason you lose it, you delete it, it gets corrupted or changed, you can find it in the installation media that you download or we have it available up on our site. So this is a development environment. We have our screen list here uh, under the graphics tab. And as you can see, there's several screens. Uh, inside of here, we also have if we create any groups or a graphic script. On the tasks tab, we see all of our major features that we've discussed, alarms, trending recipes, and so on. Uh, and then on the com tab, this is where we come to configure our drivers or our OPC or TCP IP worksheets. So to start the application, we can either come here on the home tab to the local management or up at the top and just click on run. And it comes up. And here is the PC demo application. Uh, so just to quickly show you, here's the multi-language feature. I have English. If I come in here, I can say click on the Brazilian flag and it'll show Portuguese. You can come back, click German, Mexican, and so on. And you see how quickly we can switch between languages. And then if I go to my features group, we see that we have animations that first come up. And we see all the different kinds of animations we have available. We have our bar graph animation. And you see here, it doesn't necessarily just have to be an actual bar. We can do an oval, or we can do a closed polygon that represents the cutout of a object. For this example, a tank. We have our color animations. You can see we can cycle between different colors. We can also do a fade in or out. And this is actually what's called transparency so we can make something semi-transparent then we have our data entry here which is using the text data link so for example this one here I can change that from 50 to 99 I can click here to change bring up a pop-up keypad I can click what I want or type it as well and then we have our text boxes, multi-line or scroll. Then we have our position. This also, once again, shows transparency. But we see how we can just simply change not, only, not the color, because these aren't changing colors. These are actually changing the object. So it's cycling between two different objects it's displaying. Then we have our rotation animation. You see the little needle cycling between 0 and 500. Our size. And down here is our position. And this is, this is behaving differently than the others. It's not automated. And that's because with position and resize and rotation as well, we can enable it to be a what's called a gesture or enable the slider, essentially. And what this means is that we can then manipulate it with our mouse or our touch. And the downside with rotation and size is I can't show you those because those require multi-touch. So if I come to <clears throat> excuse me, the multi-touch here, here's the rotation. What I would have to do is I'd actually have to touch this dial as if it's a physical dial. So I'd have to kind of grab it and turn with two points, and it would actually rotate. The same holds true for here to do the pan, zoom, and rotate. Now I can click it and move it around. But I can't rotate and I can't resize because that's once again is the pinch and zoom. So I need two points. And unfortunately, I don't have a touch screen display on my laptop. <clears throat> but if we show you now our active objects, here is essentially the gamut of the objects we have available. As I mentioned, a combo box, which can be linked to a database as well. So we can query a database table for information. 
bring back the results and display them in the combo box. Uh, our radio buttons, which can be the classic style or can be button shaped. So we could touch these and this is actually radio buttons, but they look like they're buttons. And then our check boxes, which once again can also be set up to look like buttons. List box, our smart messages here. Our push buttons, which are really here for legacy purposes. These aren't used widely in modern or newer applications. They're there really to make sure that older applications that come in are still supported. And then we see our grid control down here. You can see it's just a nice little spreadsheet or table or grid that you can just display information, be it from a text file, class tag, or a database. And then we see our example of our ActiveX or .NET controls. Now this is just a, a video that is looping, but we could connect this or configure this to be a live feed. So I could, if I thought of it ahead of time, I could have actually tied into my camera that we're using for this video and displayed it here on the screen. And then we see our recipe management, which is simply just a worksheet. All that we've done here is put a front end to it. And this was all created using the active objects, the buttons, uh, the text boxes. And that's, as I mentioned, the one, in my opinion, the one shortcoming for the recipes is that we don't have a front end. We don't have a control object. It has to be built. But overall, the recipe feature is very powerful and, and really easy to use. Here are our report options. So we have our four major groups here. So I will save the HTML report. And then I'll view it. And here we go. Now we see the report comes up. And since it's HTML, we can insert pictures. And we inserted a nice little table right here. And we've generated the report. Here's our Boolean values, string, real, integer value. It gives us the date and the time. So it's a report generated in real time with tag values. And how that is accomplished is inside of the software under reports we open up HTML we actually put in HTML code so once again if you want to generate an HTML report it's recommended to have some knowledge or have someone who's not who is knowledgeable in HTML excuse me coding however HTML is probably one of the easier programming languages to learn uh, so if you want to learn it on your own this would be the best one to do because it's, it's not as complicated, it's not as, as, as hard to pick up as other ones. And it, it's, it's really nice to use HTML for the reports because you can make very, very fancy reports. In fact, you can take a snapshot of your trend, which I'll show you here in a second. I'll go to trends. We could take a snapshot of this and insert it into an HTML report. And also, since we're talking about trends, the great part about the trend control is we have multiple pens. And you see each one has their own individual channel. But up here under the uh, controls, I could set them all to be on one channel. So we see them all overlapped. Looks kind of messy, so we can separate them as well. Additionally, we can put a cursor here. And we get not only what the current value is, but also the cursor value. And there is SPC, or Statistical Process Control, options. And we see them here. We see the average, the count, and the standard deviation. So we can configure and calculate these functions, these, these additional pieces of information that we need for our pens on the trend in real time. And also, it, we can configure what we see in real time here. So let's say, OK, I don't need to know the level right now, so I can hide it. Or I can outright remove it. And then if I wanted to, I could come down here. Actually, I'll come up here and I'll click on the Add Pen. And then I will pick one. So I don't think there was vibration. So I'll pick that and click OK. And now I've added a new pen. So I can configure my view for how much day or time I want to see, the ranges for each one, and which pens to see, and what colors even. And then I can save that off as a custom view. So you could have, let's say, three shifts that run your, your operation. 
The first shift might have their own specific view. Well, they can configure it, save it, and then they can use that. And then when the second shift, shift comes in, they can load in their custom view. So they don't have to mess around with changing the settings every single time. And then with alarms, we see up here uh, the online or real time, and down here is the alarm history. So I'll trigger some alarms so we can see the difference. And then you see here that we have four alarms for the online, and we have five entries here because this is historical, so it's showing each different piece of information based on that. So we see here that this one went low, it was triggered, and then here it was recovered. It still hasn't been acknowledged though. So if I come up here and I acknowledge this, it'll ask me to put a comment in, and you see it disappears here, but now we see it come up here. So we can configure our alarm controls for several different type of views. Additionally, we can filter. And this is not a window that was designed. This is pre-canned. We just trigger the filter from the control. It comes up and allows me to select what groups I want to see, the priority, the, the period, the selection. And all of that is pre-canned, and we just had to trigger that filter window to appear. We didn't have to set any of that up. And then if we look at industries, we see here a nice example of animation in what would be kind of a real world setting with a couple of presses on a line. If we look at, say, wind power, which is one of my favorite, we see here we have several different things. We have our position animation, bar graphs. We can turn uh, turbines on and off. We see our alarms down here, an image placed on the screen, a, another image which represents a map and we have our rotation animation. And then sol solar power is the same thing. So as you can see with these screens, we can use every single facet of the software and we can create dynamic customized screens and also screens that can be customizable at runtime. Uh, example, under solutions, we have OEE and Andon. So OEE stands for Overall Equipment Effectiveness. And Andon is just a fancy Japanese word for dashboard. This is just status information. Uh, so for OEE, we can pick a different machine here. And as you can see, we're cycling through. We can pick a different selection period. So let's say the year. And I pick machine four. We see everything changes. And now if I come to Andon, it shows me machine four, the image, and my big hitters, my information I need to know. If I come back to OEE and I say pick machine one and I do current shift, come back, now it's machine one and it gives me the numbers appropriate for that. So these screens can be customized at runtime to display the information you want based on selections. And the last thing that I want to show you is, <clears throat> excuse me, under the control panel here, we see that we have our animation, but also we have several different buttons, and this is using visibility. We're not changing colors, we're actually swapping between a lit and unlit uh, lamp, and then we can switch between auto and manual, and turn the power on and off. We can see that we can control rotation. We can select between them. And all this is done, if I come back in here, and we want Industries Control Panel. You see here, if we come in, here's our visibility or position animation for this fan image. So we can configure not only a tag inside of here or static value, but also a function or a formula that we can use to calculate the value we want to see. So not only can we use that inside of our animation, but if we needed to use scripting, we see our simulation script here. And this comes through, and this is creating all of the data points for the graph, I'm sorry, the trend control. It's also creating some additional values for other screens, like the solar or wind power screens that we saw. So we can create several different simulated screens or demonstrations if we want, not only through our animation using formulas or functions, but scripting and 
as I've mentioned in the uh, presentation, the pens, or I'm sorry, the scheduler. So here we see that this one is simply doing the simulations for the trend control object for the pens. But you can see the type of power and automation that we have available inside of the software. So that concludes the demonstration and presentation uh, portion. Are there any questions right now? Okay. So, all right. Then if there aren't any questions right now, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, conclude this webinar. Um, if you have any future questions, uh, please feel free to submit them to our tech support department by email at support at profaceamerica.com or by phone 1-800-289-9266, option 2. Uh, if you enjoyed this webinar, please like or share the, the video below. Uh, you can also subscribe to our channel for tutorial videos or informational videos on not only the Blue Open Studio software, but our other software packages and our hardware as well, uh, along with more live webinars in the future. Also, for those who registered for the webinar, please be on the lookout for a survey from ProFace America. Uh, we'd appreciate your feedback uh, regarding this webinar, but also any potential topics for future webinars. So, once again, uh, thanks for attending and have a great rest of your day.